Welcome to Brain and Avat. We're delighted to be joined by Sophie Grace Chapel, and we're going to be talking about her latest book, which is uh, hot off the presses on epiphanies. Sophie Grace, would you like to start with a thought experiment? So this is a quotation from uh, The Sovereignty of Goodness by Iris Murdoch from 1970. I'm looking out of my window, Murdoch writes, in an anxious and resentful state of mind, oblivious of my surroundings, brooding perhaps on some damage done to my prestige. Then suddenly I observe a hovering kestrel. In a moment, everything is altered. The brooding self with its hurt vanity has disappeared. There is nothing now but kestrel. And when I return to thinking of the other matter, it seems less important. And I'm, I'm going to conjoin that experience, which is an experience of a bird, with an experience of my own, which is an experience of a tree. And this is something I wrote on Facebook, actually, uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and it's an autobiographical snippet. And it goes like this. I woke up this morning in an attic room in the Good Enough Club in Mecklenburg Square in Bloomsbury. I opened the window and looked blearily out. My first impression was vague green and vague cold. Then the cold resolved itself into delightful cool breeze on a sunny London morning, and the green resolved itself into the tall mature plane trees in the private garden in the middle of that deserted Georgian space. I was four flights up, yet my eye level seemed to be little more than halfway up the great plains. And from root to leaf tip, these huge trees were swaying gently in the wind, like giant living creatures that secretly dance. The top of a red crane, visible in the distance above them, was swaying too. I felt like I was on board a tall ship in full sail. I felt like everything I was looking at was charged with life. Yet I walked across Mecklenburg Square a dozen or twenty times, and I've never even noticed the trees before. Now, what these two experiences, these reports of experience, involve is what I call an epiphany. An epiphany is a moment where you see something, or you hear something, or something occurs to you, which transforms the way that you see uh, your position in the world, where you are, what's going on. In a sense, they're a bit like what Laurie Paul has in mind when she writes about transformative experiences. But there are lots of differences too, and we might come on to those later. The idea of an epiphany is the idea that certain experiences can be revel revelatory of value to you. So you're in a situation where you are, in some sense, pe people use these metaphors, and perhaps they're ableist metaphors, so I won't worry too much about that for now, I'll just crash ahead and use them. People talk about being blind and deaf to value that surround you. And these are experiences where, as it were, your eyes are open, or your ears are unstopped, you suddenly become aware of the value in your environment. And in Iris Murdoch's case, she's thinking perhaps about the kind of squabbles that academics have in senior common rooms in Oxford colleges, or department meetings, or faculty meetings, or whatever it is, where people in various more or less sophisticated ways take various kinds of chunk out of each other's egos. And it's all very nasty and backbiting and you can get very drawn into this kind of game and very worried about it and something suddenly happens to Iris Murdoch in this description that takes her right out of that frame of mind that she was in a frame of mind where what seemed to matter was simply this kind of concern with her prestige, concern with her ego, her status in the world, all of that was what seemed so terribly important and then you see something in nature which is going about its own purposes, and which has a certain kind of beauty that arrests you, and stops you, and stills you, and takes you out of those petty egotistical concerns, and makes you see things in what one wants to call a truer perspective. And we can argue, no doubt, at great length about the sense in which it is a truer perspective, and how it is that this is, so to speak, cleansing your timeline. But something like that happens, something happens to you which feels like a revelation of value. And in the case of the Mecklenburg Square experience that I described on Facebook, what happened to me there was that I was in London for, I, I can't remember now what kind of meeting it was, it was some kind of business meeting, and it was very much, 
I, I approached it. I, I was busy at the time and I was concerned with various kinds of stuff that was going on in my professional life. And I was the hamster on the wheel, if you like, scurrying away, um, getting nowhere fast with all the scrabbling and agitation of the pause. And so you wake up in this, in this slightly uh, frazzled state of mind where you're thinking about various kinds of professional pressure that are going to come on you, stuff that you have to do that you don't particularly want to do, which is going to preoccupy you today. And I get out of bed and I wander over to the window and because it's been rather hot overnight, as it often is in London, compared with Scotland where I live, I open the window wide and lean out of it. And in that moment, slowly, things outside there come into focus. And I suddenly feel, as I say in the description, like a little child in front of a giant, or like someone, like, like a sailor halfway up the rigging of a ship, or like I'm standing um, on some bridge next to a harbour, and a ship is going past, and I'm halfway up it, and it's magnificent and splendid, and it takes me out of myself. That was how it felt to see those plane trees. And if you're ever in London, and you happen to be in Bloomsbury in particular, then I do urge you to go and have a look at Mecklenburg Square. And who knows what will happen if you do that? Maybe you won't have anything like the same kind of encounter with those trees that I had, but maybe you will. Maybe you'll have some other different kind of encounter. So this was a moment that stilled me, a moment that stopped me in my tracks, a moment that made me reconnect with what I actually value, what I actually care about, which is not the various kinds of scrabbling and hamster on the wheel experiences that we all have at work. That's not really what I care about. And if there is a reason for doing all that kind of bureaucratic um, activity, then it lies somewhere deeper. And it connects with the kind of values that I felt myself connecting with in looking at those trees and getting a sense of stillness and beauty and fresh air and the grandeur of something that was not me and that took me away from my own concerns. So those are two examples of what I call epiphanies. They're moments where you get stopped in your tracks by something beautiful that comes your way and that makes you think, hang on a minute, why have I been so preoccupied with those petty concerns? This is the real deal. This is reality. This is what's really there and what's really worth living for and really worth connecting with and engaging with. And I want to rejig myself psychologically so that I'm listening. I mean, you can't make moments like this happen, perhaps, but you can cultivate an openness to them. You can cultivate an ability to hear and not to be so deaf to what's going on outside you, um, outside your own ego, that you cannot see this kind of value. And what I want to say about moments like that is that there's something here that can be a resource to us in thinking about philosophical ethics, in thinking about how we do philosophical ethics. And in particular, I want to say, this isn't the only thing that you need for a philosophical ethics, which is not focused on, as so much philosophical ethics is, on the construction of a single neat systematic theory of moral philosophy. This isn't the only thing that you need, but it's part of what you might be thinking about if you decided that you wanted to do moral philosophy without doing systematic theory. Epiph epiphanies are one of the things that might begin to loom large for you and might begin to be something that you think it's really important to have in our thinking as philosophers when we think about value. So if there's a thought experiment there, perhaps it's not a a thought experiment of the classical design, but what it comes to is this. There are things that can happen to us, which I think should undermine our confidence in a lot of the most conventional ways of doing ethics that we're confronted with today, and which should make us want, as philosophers, because we're filled with the spirit of inquiry, let's hope, would make, they, they should make us want to reach out and try and explore experiences like that, and try and get a stronger grasp on what it is that such experiences have to teach us about what it's like to be human beings living in this world and striving for value and striving for meaning in a world like this. So I find it very interesting because I come from a background of Buddhism where these sorts of experiences are highly prioritized. 
the practice of Buddhism is really about trying to generate these kinds of experiences. And I used to be a, a very avid practitioner. I used to spend a lot of time in monasteries. And then I had a moment where I thought, why are these experiences more real? You spoke about this being truer or more real. Why think that? And there's sort of been a backlash both in my own mind, but also in the general literature around meditation and this prioritization of epiphanies where some people say, what makes you think the concerns and thoughts and worries that we have on a daily basis are less real? And that was sufficient to make me feel like, I'm not sure these are the real deal and the rest of life is a distraction, or maybe these are just little respites that mm. have sort of entertainment value, but no other sort of value. So those are the two different kind of competing perspectives in my own mind around these sort of experiences. And then the other reason I'm very curious about this is because I'm a science fiction writer and that really is about generating experiences that are very much divorced from our everyday world, although there might be reflections of issues from our everyday world in those experiences in reading and watching science fiction. And yet the writer in me wants to say those experiences are extremely valuable. They're extremely important beyond just entertainment. But then I think again, well, maybe they're not, maybe it's just entertainment. It's fun to have at the time, but then we've got to get back to, you know, everyday life. It's interesting that you've taken this tack that these experiences are the important thing. These are very important features of our reality. Yes, absolutely. You're saying that these things are, so to speak, a, a good experiential holiday, but then we've got to get back. The way you phrase that reminded me a little of one of the most famous lines in Plato's Republic, where after the vision of the forms has been granted to uh, Plato's philosopher pupils, after that vision, after all the education and the ascent to the form of the good, Plato says to his philosophers, Katabation un, you need to go back down. It's time to go back down there. So the philosophers have been on the heights and they have to get back to ordinary life and presumably organizing Callipolis, the fair city, for perhaps in more than one sense of fair, for Plato's philosophers. Presumably that task is going to involve a great deal of drudge and it's going to be hard, it's going to be detailed, it's going to be nitty gritty. It's not always going to be about being sensationally on the heights. Now, this kind of balance between the moments of sublimity and the nitty gritty hours or weeks where you have to work out how to live that vision and how to translate that vision into some kind of improved reality. That's a very familiar contrast. And of course, it's there in Buddhism. And of course, it's there in Plato, as I've just been saying, and it's there in the Christian tradition too, in, in talking about the relation between the moments of mystical e ecstasy or the moments of elevation and the rest of your life when you have to work out what to do with them. And alongside Plato's Katabate on Un, there is the famous moment in the Gospels where some of the disciples, the, the, the three or four most favoured disciples, go up the mount with Jesus and there they have the vision of him in glory. He's transfigured before them. And that transfiguration, then they have to take back down the mountain and live out in the rest of their lives. So I guess what I'm saying by drawing on all these contrasts is that I don't disagree with you, Jason, that ordinary life has its value too. But what I think we can do with these moments of epiphany is we can use them to rethink the way we approach the rest of life. And in one key, it, it might be that you're going along doing philosophical theory in the normal way, under the usual pressures for publication and competition with your peers, and hoping to get, you know, the umpteenth iteration of rule consequentialism that beats all the others. And here it is, my brand new sparkling theory. And then what happened to me as a matter of autobiography is that um, I came to think 
that actually that kind of moral theorizing was at any rate not for me. It wasn't something that I could do to any good effect. And I came to think that instead what we should do, what I should do at any rate as a philosopher, is try and work out precisely this, how to live out the value of those moments of sublimity and how to get those moments of sublimity to color the rest of experience. So going back to Murdoch, there's a kind of before and after. She says at the end of the bit I quoted from The Sovereignty of Goodness, the other matter does not seem no in, so important now when I come back to it. So the contrast the before and the after for Murdoch, and perhaps you'll see what might be said about how these experiences do change the rest of life. So beforehand, there's just what Murdoch calls the fat relentless ego. There's just the particular concerns that you have with the bureaucratic process that you're caught up in, and you're not looking any further. And then the experience with the hawk comes along. And after that, of course, you still have to go to meetings of the, the fellowship of your college. And of course, there still will be tiresome people who are trying to get the teeth in your ankle. Everything will go on for them, much as before. But with any luck, you will be able to bring to situations like that something that a religious person might call grace. That is to say, you might be able to bring to those situations a sense of a deeper and wider and fuller perspective in which you can see the essential, well, ridiculousness of a lot of what we are as human beings. A lot of what we are as human beings, this is something I say in chapter four of the book, a lot of what we are is just ridiculous and we should laugh at ourselves more. We should see ourselves as the small things we are, the small creatures we are. We should see our concerns as sometimes really very petty and having that larger perspective and having the, for want of a better word, joy that epiphanies can bring you can transform the way you engage in the rest of life. So I think I do believe that experiences of that sort can be transformative and can be redemptive too. So I think you're right to point out that these peak moments can be truly transformative in someone's life. They can change their entire belief system but it might be that they change them for the worse. So we can imagine someone that, for example, has a peak experience that involves the supernatural. They believe that they've been visited by an angel, for example, or by an alien spacecraft. And it's such a vivid landmark moment in their life that it makes them completely recalibrate all their other beliefs. And we'll assume for the sake of argument that there are no angels or there are no aliens, and they're now proceeding accordingly um, as if they were because they've had this moment. We might think, a similar danger in moral philosophy where someone has this landmark moment something very vivid and it completely changes their their outlook about what kinds of moral principles ought to guide them mm. you know i often think about hollywood morality does this where you get a sense yeah. of there's something vivid there's the action hero you know we think that it's okay for clint eastwood to shoot a bad guy in the back because it just looks cool and he's got this great one-liner attached to it and you sort of think this is what justice demands and the worry, of course, is that when we transplant ourselves back into the ordinary realm, that we might not want to rely on those peak moments for general guidance. Yeah, well, I suppose one thing to say about this is that there is a way of generating doubt about any of the resources that we might want to use in philosophy, which is to point to their fallibility. And I'm making no claim that epiphany is an infallible resource, that resources don't need to be infallible resources to be resources. And if we were looking for something that was infallible, then I don't think we'd ever find it. So, I mean, the quick and glib thing to say here is that if we thought that the possibility of forged money invalidated the use of money, then we'd never be able to spend or buy or sell anything at all. And we, we don't in fact proceed like that. Of course, we accept that risk, but we get on. And unless we're living in a commune somewhere, lucky us, then we do use money. So likewise here, I'd want to say that much, that the, the, the unavoidable fact of fallibility isn't the end of the story, nor I'd want to add, this is a second, perhaps more interesting thought, is the fact that there isn't a single infallible method for detecting fallibility or mistake, nor is that the end of the story. It's, it's very generally the case that we not only have fallible methods, we also have no infallible method of detecting when our methods have gone wrong. 
There's no infallible method either. And that's all fine. That's just how it goes. At this point, people tend to wave the word judgment around and it looks like smoke and mirrors because it looks as if there's a word there that people are not going to spell out at all. Well, let me try and spell out a bit what might be meant by talking of judgment in this instance. So I take it that whenever you have an epiphanic experience, then it's part of your job as a responsible epistemic agent to try and make sense of what you've just experienced and to reflect on it and to bring it into contact with other things that have occurred to you and other experiences that you've had and other beliefs that you have, which you are as, you know, as much in reflective equilibrium with everything else as anything possibly could be. So it's absolutely sure could be to you that murder is a pretty bad thing to be doing. So here's someone who's doing murder in a stylish and charismatic and snazzy way. That experience may look epiphanic. There might indeed be something epiphanic about it. You might, in the process of judgment and reflection, find yourself asking, well, I think that's okay in the context of a Coen Brothers movie. Perhaps it's all right there for murder to be stylish. How much further can we, than that can we go? Does the fact that we can't go any further than that, we can't admire the stylishness of murder in the real world without there being something clearly pretty gravely morally wrong with us. The point is simply that it's this kind of thing that we're talking about when we talk about fallible judgment applied to the moral assessment and indeed the aesthetic assessment too, the, the valuation assessment in general of various kinds of vivid experience that we might have. So, so here's the thing we can do with art. We can experience an epiphany that we would never experience in real life. Clint, Clint Eastwood stylishly shooting people might be a case in point. Films in particular, I think, because film is such a vivid art form, they give us this ability to, to feel our way into other people's experience to say, wow, well, that could be epiphanic for you. Okay, that's really interesting. In real life, that could never be epiphanic for me, but I see how via the fiction, it was epiphanic for you. And that's an extraordinarily revealing thing for me. That was all rather a long and roundabout way of saying that, of course, epiphanies can be flawed. Of course, epiphanies can be grossly misleading. Lenny Riefenstahl's films of Hitler and the Nuremberg rallies were famously intended precisely to induce epiphanic experiences of Nazism. I don't want to deny that can happen. I do want to deny that that means that we can't use the notion of epiphanies. Absolutely, it doesn't mean that. Of course, we can use the notion. Um, if, if I may drop into Latin, corruptio optimi pessima, the corruption of the best is the worst. And epiphanies are, I think, one of our best resources. And because they're so powerful, that so much evil can be done with them when they're abused. So now I want to ask a clarifying question, which is how specifically can they be used in ethics? So we're trying to arrive at an ethical theory. Suppose it's a, a theory of right action. So is it that is the right maker for an action is the, the question that a lot of um, ethicists ask and try to answer. I'm avowedly an anti-theorist. I don't believe that there is a theory of right action in the sense of a filling for the right-hand side of a formula which has on the left-hand side of it an action is right and then in the middle if and only if. An action is right if and only if. I don't think you can give an interesting substantive sharp-edged answer that question. I'm not against the idea that in certain circumstances, ethical theories can give us, so to speak, advice. We can look to ethical theories and say, well, this might be a situation where you want to do what's most favored by the cost-benefit analysis out of these alternatives. And here are some numbers to play with. And if you put those numbers in, then it turns out that so scoring things, option A comes out as the one to do. I'm not against the possibility of that kind of thinking. All I want to say about it is that it never has the status of more than advice. You can look to such as they, oh, that's interesting. Okay, that's what that sort of rule utilitarian would tell me to do here. That's interesting. And there it stops. Uh, that's interesting. And the, the step at which the further step of deciding to act on this interesting advice is indeed a further step. And at this point, I think I sometimes sound a bit like an existentialist because it is precisely what I want to say, that committing yourself to be bound in a given situation by that kind of decision procedure is a commitment which you might not have taken. I think it's very unlikely 
that there is a single decision procedure of that form, which again is non-platitudinous, not nearly trivial. I think it's most unlikely that there's such a decision procedure which will apply in all circumstances. I think the quest for such a decision procedure, and this I know is fighting to, to an act utilitarian, is somewhat in danger of what Sartre called mauvaise foi, bad faith. I think there is a danger of submitting, by bad faith I understand this, it's not quite as polemical as it sounds, I think there's a danger of submitting our ethical intelligence to a kind of sausage machine approach to ethical decision making, which is actually a lot less intelligent than we are ourselves. And I don't think we should do that. I think we should always say, when confronted with the, the outputs of any ethical decision making sausage machine, we should always say, that's interesting. That could be right. Let's think about it some more, because maybe it isn't. So I don't think there is a foundational ethical theory in that sense, which can be applied in all circumstances, and which is just the truth, capital T, about uh, what we should. And that's because, well, it's fundamentally because I don't see why, I, I think the onus of proof is on the theoretical side. I don't see why there should be such a neat shape to ethics. What I want to put in place of that kind of theory-based thinking is an approach in which we take time to reflect upon the variety of value that we find around us, us in the world. And we allow that value to seep into us. I'm thinking here of a wonderful paper by Iris Murdoch called The Darkness of Practical Reason, in which Iris Murdoch talks about the way in which our whole ethical outlook is set up by influences on us, which are experiential, but very often not discursively rational in the way that we analytic philosophers are so fond of. So it's, it's a kind of Wittgensteinian approach too. I want to appeal to the idea that we live within a form of life and we try to make sense of ourselves within that form of life. The form of life is open-ended and we're constantly improvising within a musical tradition, so to speak. That's an analogy for thinking about how ethics goes. And we have to think all the time about what's important here. What do I really value? Who am I? Who do I want to become? Where am I going? Those kinds of questions. And when we get in particular the question, what's valuable here? What do I value here? I think then we're reaching out towards the world of value around us in ways that can't be compressed into a systematic ethical theory. So I wonder about this. I take it your claim is that there are things in reality that are true and there's different mechanisms we can use to discover them so it's not the case that value is merely invented by us there is something out there that is good or is right or is beautiful or is true and one way to access it would be through a theoretical framework and one way to access it would be through as you say living your life having these experiences i suppose the question is which method is more likely to track truth there's a concern that take the burden on ourselves and use our limited experiences to determine what the right thing to do is we might be like in a cave with one single flashlight whereas the theory uh, and the sort of wisdom of many people that have thought through it the floodlights and it might be that there's still going to be some dark nooks and crannies in the cave and maybe that's where our personal experience can play a role of course the problem is that the theorists don't agree with each other right i mean it's not like there's one dominant theory that everybody says well this tells us so the, the theoretical school has some problems, but I wonder if the experiential school can solve those problems. Well, um, I'm tempted to take your metaphor of being alone with a, with a torch in a cave um, and stand it on its head, because it often seems to me that actually moral theory finds it very difficult to bring into its way of thinking the kind of resources that humans have always had for thinking about what they most value, which are represented in, in literature, poetry, music, that kind of thing. So I devote a lot of time in the book to trying to work out what it might be to be in touch with what I'll call collectively the humane tradition, where human beings try to get a clear sense of what it's like to be a human being and what matters in being a human being. And I think moral theory, a lot of the time, jumps the gun in wanting to systematize 
this material before it has really been uh, reflected on and made part of the fabric of our own psychology. And I think that's, I think we need as human beings to reflect indefinitely upon art and because art is of the human beings telling us what they have experienced. Art is human beings carrying a flashlight around, shining the light that they've seen. And we need to spend more time with that. And uh, in, in my view, more time with that and less time on trying to fill in the right hand side of an action is right if and only if. So I think, as you say, the theories, the moral theories that people devise disagree. I've already implied that can't be a decisive difficulty for moral theory, precisely because I, I allow that a method can be fallible. In fact, I think it's required. We have to recognize that all methods are fallible, including the attempt to supply a moral theory. But if one does get some plausible moral theories going, then I think what they give us is considerations to weigh in our judgment. And I think what they give us a lot of the time is also a kind of latitude about whether that is the kind of consideration that settles this case or whether we should think about it in some other way. And I think that kind of flexibility and pluralism in our approach to moral problems is fruitful and helpful. And I think insisting that there is a single catch-all method for all problems is profoundly unhelpful. So I want to provide a, an alternative view on this. So I think Mark granted you too much. So Mark in his suggestion said that perhaps theoretical frameworks aim at a certain answer, epiphanic experience aims at an answer, and you could go sort of either way and there are competing theories or co not theories because you don't like the theoretic approach to epiphanies, but they're competing methods for arriving at truths about value and our moral experience. But I wonder whether there is, that's really what's happening. It seems to me like you're doing something else. So moral theories are trying to give an answer to this equation, the right hand side of mm -hmm. if and only if an action's right, if and only if maybe you're doing something else. So perhaps you're trying to achieve the answer on account of different types of values. So maybe mm -hmm. it's values around what love is or what, mm -hmm. and how important love is in our lives or what perfection is and the enhancement of our skills or other values, mm -hmm. meaning, and perhaps these theories are not at loggerheads. Perhaps theories, moral theories are trying to tell us what's right or wrong, while what you're doing is tell us the place that right or wrong has or should have in our lives. But those seem compatible. In other words, it seems like you could grant utilitarians or Kantians all the legroom they need and still say that epiphanies are important, but answering a different question, maybe a meta question or answers around other values. Yes, I think there's something to that, but I don't think I go all the way with you on that. I, I do think that part of what I'm advocating in my whole approach is to some extent to change your subject. I, th I think that's true. One of the papers that I wrote that got me going in this direction towards thinking about anti-theory was a paper I published in, I think it was about 2011, called Glory as an Ethical Idea. And that paper wound up as a chapter in the 2014 book, Knowing What to Do. And the point of the paper is, look, here's a central phenomenon in our lives, the phenomenon of glory. And glory, I define in that paper, um, I'm not sure you, you can give a definition of it which catches all the cases, but just as a general um, rule of thumb introduction kind of definition, you can say that glory is what you have when a fantastically good um, try is scored with enormous skill in front of a packed um, stadium. And you need both the audience and the performance for glory to be there. It's not glory if the audience is missing and there's just the, the brilliant try scored in practice in an empty stadium. That's not glory, as we perhaps have noticed when watching Rugby Without. 
um, any audience at all in big echoing stadiums. There's been something profoundly missing there because the audience is in there. So glory happens when you've got the correct reaction, the fitting reaction, the reaction of wonder and awe at this marvellous performance and the marvellous performance, and you need both of them together. And so the paper is about why hasn't why haven't moral philosophers been more interested in this kind of phenomenon? And there are some answers there which I think diagnose um, points that go deep into the structure of moral philosophy as we have it. In particular, um, in that paper, I talk about Sidgwick and how Sidgwick, he, he does confront something close to glory, namely fame, towards the end of the methods of ethics. And Sidgwick says, well, why would people want fame? Well, it would have to be an amalgam of moral motives that they might have with um, prudential motives that they might have and uh, the prudential motives are essentially self-interested it's about glory for me it's about bigging up my ego and the moral motives are to do with improving the lives of others and i'm saying it in that kind of way because I, I do find this kind of thing terribly self-parodic it's all awfully victorian and it's all within a series of dichotomies that i i simply don't accept and want to reject um and I don't think someone with Sidgwick's moral philosophical background can give us a good understanding of glory, the phenomenon of glory. And I wanted to think, well, why is that? Why is it that so much of what we do in moral philosophy is like this example case of glory? It doesn't fit. It doesn't jibe with the categories and the concerns that ordinary human beings actually value in their thinking about value. So there's all of that going on and in that sense what i'm doing is a change of subject but it's also a critique of the dichotomies that someone like Sidgwick train trades in moral prudential altruism egoism hypothetical imperatives categorical imperatives my utility their utility those are the kind of dichotomies that Sidgwick's whole approach is founded on and i think that when we reflect on ordinary life it gives us reason to challenge them and I'm going to say that as the kind of taster to what I want to say more generally about a lot of ethical theory, which is that a lot of time it rests on dichotomies that don't actually correspond to the way humans get on with experiencing value in ordinary life. And I think that's a, the, there's the seed of criticism there, which can be applied both to utilitarianism and to Kantianism and to other moral theories too, and to the whole business of trying to do thinking about value by supplying the right-hand side to the biconditional an act is right if and only if um so at this point i'm talking myself i'm deliberately talking myself from agreeing with you that there's a change of subject involved to saying what i also want to say which is that change of subject has consequences if i'm right for the way we should think about a lot of moral theorizing and another case um i, I will shut up in a moment i promise but just briefly another case of the same sort that i'm thinking about at the moment because of a conference paper that I'm going to be giving soon. Philosophers have got themselves really worked up about the question how it's possible to love someone for their own sake in themselves. Because philosophers got very worked up, and I, I've been very worked up in things I've published myself, about the, the distinction which you find in Kant and elsewhere, it goes back to Plato at least, between instrumental uh, valuing and final valuing. And philosophers are terribly worried that we might always be instrumentalizing others when we value them if i value jason and you ask me why do you value jason i say i value jason because jason has f then immediately people say ah so you really value f not jason and you'd value if mark had as much f as jason has you'd value mark and so you get the usual list of problems now it seems to me that there must be something suspect about the dichotomies that are being imposed on our thinking there, precisely because in ordinary life people do not suffer unless they're philosophers from a great deal of anxiety about this kind of issue we, we just don't in general worry about that kind of thing we know how to value i know how to value jason who is f without valuing just the fness that jason has in practice we don't get that kind of problem i'm, I'm not entirely clear in my thinking about this particular case but i think it is an instance of the general pattern of moral theory making distinctions and problems that aren't actually there in ordinary life it's not that we don't have problems we have other problems i'm not saying that in ordinary life everything is in order exactly as it is i'm a bit of a wittgensteinian but not that much i don't believe that of course things aren't entirely in order in ordinary life but we often don't have the problems that you'd predict 
if you thought moral philosophy was giving a true picture of the domain. So there's a very long way of saying, um, yes, it is to some extent a change of subject, but the change of subject has momentous consequences, I think, for the orthodox theorizing. So one of the sections in your book that I thoroughly enjoyed was trying to map out the parts of human experience that are valuable. And you've got sections on sex and humor, which I think are you know, everyone's favorite topics. Could you tell us a bit <laughs> about that? Well, I think that for most people, I'll, I'll do sex first, then we'll come on to humor. That perhaps is the natural order of things. I think that for most human beings, and one always has to speak with enormous care in this area because one can sound like one is saying things that one is not saying at all. Um, and why am I using one? That's another kind of inhibition revealing itself, isn't it? I, I think that when we talk about sex, we have to be very careful because we don't want to be misinterpreted. But here's what I want to say. I think for most people, there is a sexual dimension to their experience, which is to say they are capable of seeing other people around them in a sexual light. And that's an an ever available possibility for most people have stronger or weaker sex drives. Some people have no sex drive at all. Some people are consumed by their sex drives, but for everybody, it's, it's like having a sense of smell. And perhaps it is in fact, physiologically and psychologically allied to having a sense of smell. There is a sexual dimension to our awareness of the world. And it's this talk of dimensions that I want to focus on mainly here, that kind of awareness of others around us which is sometimes sexually modulated and sometimes olfactorily modulated. We notice how people smell sometimes, we notice how they sound, we notice how they look. These kinds of dimensions of experience, I enumerate about 10 of them in the book, and then I give a list of things I haven't listed, because as so often when I do a catalogue of things in philosophy, I find myself wanting to say, not what moral ph philosophers typically say, or philosophers generally tend to say, which is, and that's it, here's the end of the catalogue, and if you think there's anything else that should be in the catalogue, I'll fight you, because this catalogue is complete. I am very much against that impulse to sign things off, to seal them and wrap them up. I prefer things to be open-ended. That's why I have a list of things I haven't listed, because I think my account of the various dimensions, as I call them, of experience, could have gone very differently might have gone very differently if I'd simply written it at a different point in my life, and that's fine. But another dimension is humour. I think there are, just as there are sexual affordances in a lot of situations for us human beings, or most of us, so likewise there are humorous affordances in a lot of situations for us human beings. There's the potential for humour in a lot of what we see around us. And I don't know whether I think that having a keenly marked sexual awareness is a virtue or not. I don't know what I think about that. But having an awareness of humour, a sensitivity to the humorous affordances of the situations you find yourself in, I'm pretty sure that is a virtue and an important one. Being aware that everything is potentially comic, including the situation we're in right now. There's always comic potential in our lives. And I think it's the mark of a good person to be aware of that and to be open to it. And um, obviously, there's a kind of Aristotelian mean here. You don't want someone who never stops horsing around and won't be serious about anything. But you do want someone who's always capable of the little jokes that go with affability or the various kind of pranks we can pull, verbal humour, that kind of thing. Playfulness, I think this is an important aspect of what it's like to be a human. And it's certainly not one that I would want to do with that. I think actually I would, if, if I had to choose, I would more readily forego my sexual awareness than my awareness of humor. But I don't Some... have to choose, thank God. <laughs> Something you write about in the book, you have a chapter on how epiphanic thinking influences whether we prioritize the individual or the group or the collective. It's something I'm very interested in because uh, my writing is on why collectives don't exist. So I always prioritize the individual in my thinking. And I found your reasoning in that chapter interesting because if I understood correctly, your thrust is that our experience would be impossible. Our everyday experience would be impossible. It wouldn't have an origin and it wouldn't be possible without group thinking and without collective thinking and without collectives playing an influence in our lives. Can you say more about why you think collectives are so important? Right. Well, there's a huge amount to say here. 
I do take the ontology of the social extremely seriously. I don't know whether it's pretentious or, or glib or simple minded to say that Aristotle's famous line about man being a political animal is in the background here, but I, I think it is very much that idea. And there's a nice line in Pico della Mirandola that um, human beings are the beings whose nature it is to devise for themselves a nature. Or again, Iris Murdoch again, she says, man is a creature that makes pictures of himself and then comes to resemble the pictures. So I think the ontology of the social is an area of philosophy which is very live now. It's, it's clear that you, Jason, have fairly swinging views about this, um, which maybe we'll get into in a moment. For my part, what I think is that one way to understand what's going on with the social is to think about the enormous gap that you often get in meta-ethics between the Democritean world, as I call it at one point in the book, and the world of value. So a lot of the time in meta-ethics, my feeling is that we're being set up for a fall in this way. We're told, well, the world of science is just these particles, atoms in the void, nothing else but that going on in science. And the world of value is, well, all these supposed secondary quality-like qualities floating around and somehow being quasi-perceived by us and, and involved in our various assertions. And the, so there's a kind of, you know, gape factor here. How, how can we possibly get from one to the other? How do we bridge that gap? Well, I think the answer is by way of social ontology. We need to recognize that a lot of what humans are involved in, constitutively involved in, a lot of the time, is the structures that society gives us, the context that our engagement with each other gives us, the context and the forms of engagement that language gives us. So I take very seriously the idea that we are what we are as human beings because we are social creatures and because we live within traditions. And I think this generates all sorts of important and interesting extra layers in our ontology, which are partly what we need to get us across the gap from the Democritean world to the human world. So for example, chess, there are truths about what is a good move and a bad move in chess. There are truths about what's a legal move and an illegal move in chess. There are truths about how many pawns you've still got after my rampage down your Queen's side. There are truths about all those kinds of things. And these truths are constitutively chess truths, so to speak. And they're really truths, but they cannot exist without the pre-existing institution of chess. Now, I take that as a, a small scale example of the kind of thing I have in mind more generally that our human minds are constituted as what they are by their engagement in social networks, traditions, languages, means, roles, functions that we play in society, and the rest of it. There's a whole lot to be said here, and some of it touches interestingly upon the kind of things that people might want to say about gender roles and about what it is to be a man or a woman or a trans man or a trans woman, which of course is another concern of mine in another area of philosophy. But broadly speaking, what I'm going to say to you is any human being who is born is born into this pre-existing nexus of social ontology. And social ontologies are real ontologies. They, they describe things that are really there, just there in a social way, not there in a physical way. So that's what's going on there. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, Mark's heard me talk quite a lot about this. I entirely disagree with that. So... Let's use the chess example, the chess analogy. So it's not a good analogy because you wouldn't want to say that the institution of chess has caused these truths. So you wouldn't want to say that the institution of chess has caused it to be the case. There are three pawns on my queen side, for example, or that, that I castled. It seems like chess is made up of a certain set of rules which comply with our play and it's comprised of a set of descriptions uh, which describe what we do but when you're talking about social institutions you're talking about them in a causal way so it's not that it's not that my thinking is comprised of the social phenomena that cause it's that those social phenomena caused it so I think the distinction here is that in the chess case, when I'm playing chess in a real sense, I'm just instantiating the rules of chess. 
Whereas what you're describing in the social case is that these social phenomena like social institutions have a causal connection to who I am. But now if that's the case, if causation is what's happening, I want to ask this question, which I know is not a politically correct question today. The politically correct thing to think today is that there are these social structures, that there are social institutions, and that they causally impact us. But what I want to ask is, couldn't we rather just get to the bare bones of our experience, as epiphanies do, right? So they toss aside who we are, they toss aside many of our everyday concerns, and they just ask phenomenologically, what am I experiencing? So I'm experiencing the hawk, and I'm experiencing the tree. So here, what do I really experience on a daily basis? It seems to me like I don't experience an institution. So I know that you discuss and say that you think we do. You think we have direct perceptual experiences of social phenomena, but I just don't have those, and I can't make sense of that. What I do have an experience of is an individual acting towards me in a certain way, and another individual acting towards me in a certain way, and me having thoughts about that individual, and that individual ex expressing that he or she or they have thoughts about me. I don't see that as necessarily requiring citing an institution or a structure in order to explain my everyday experience, my phenomenology. And that's where I get off board, is if we're really going to talk about experiences and phenomenology, I just don't see social phenomena as requiring I don't see an ontology of the social as being required. Well, there's a lot to go through there, isn't there? So, I mean, perhaps a, a cheap and polemical way of responding might be to say, you, you can tell the time, right? So sure. you, you, you don't just see a piece of metal here and a piece of metal there against a flat board behind them with various kinds of squiggle on it. You see that it is now three o'clock you see the hands of the clock in a certain position. And that position means it's three o'clock because this one up here is, I hope I get this right, is pointing to 12 and that one there is pointing to three. And, and there's your three o'clock. So I always want to challenge people who say things like the, the famous line from, I think it's Hume, in reality, all we ever see is dot, dot, dot. And I, th this idea of direct perception of some unitary level of reality, such that level trumps or pushes aside or elbows out or swamps all the other levels. It doesn't seem to be like that to me. And I don't have the urge to say that any one of these levels is the level of reality. I think they're all levels of reality and I'm happy with that. So I look at the clock and I, I see both the pieces of metal in this position which is already itself not a bare description. If, if you really want to get bare and direct, we can go a lot more bare and direct in the direction of phenomenalism than that, and talk about patches of color, etc. But it's, it's not just that we see the hands in that position, it's also that we see that it's three o'clock, it's also that we see it's time for my lecture, it's also that I see that I'm late, it's also that I see it's now exactly three months since my girlfriend kicked me out, whatever it may be. We see all those things at once because we work within a social framework, lots of social frameworks, which overlap. You say that you don't see a social ontology here. I'm not sure how to parse that. Do you mean that you, it has to be just one ontology here and it can't be social? Or do you mean that, so that it's actually wrong to see a social ontology there? Or do you mean that there's no need to see a social ontology there? And I think that's the question I want to ask you basically, Jason, is it that there's no need for a social ontology here? Or is it that you just can't see a social ontology here? So I have no doubt that human brains have evolved in such a way that they pattern recognizers. And so we might see patterns. And all I'm saying is that we don't have to see those patterns in order to ex explain and that the patterns right. could be incorrect. And the combination of those opens the door just a little smidgen to the individualist to say, well, could we do without the social ontology? Right. Yes. So again, lots and lots to pick up here. 
On the matter of patterns, I wrote a long time ago an article about patterns and, and moral realism, and I still want to stick to the basic idea of that, which is that a lot of what we often call higher order patterns are precisely patterns, sorry, high, higher order properties are precisely patterns in lower orders of reality. I'm still uh, very much happy with that idea, and I think in some very complex way that must be the truth about how the world works, how clocks work, amongst other things. Your position, if I heard you right, is that we don't have to see it that way. I guess my answer to that is, well, why not see it that way? Because it's useful and fruitful to see it that way. And if your response to that is, well, it's just something, it's just an evolutionarily sourced heuristic, my answer to that is, I never disputed anything of the sort. I'm quite happy with it being an evolutionarily sourced heuristic. That doesn't mean that it's not real. That doesn't mean that we haven't got the social ontology that I want to talk about. The other word I want to pick up on in what you said is explanation, and perhaps we can link this back to something you started this critique with about causation. Now, when it comes to explanation and causation, I, I think I hold three theses. I think causation is objective. I think a not observer relative. I think explanation is subjective and observer relative. And I think causal explanation is somewhere in between, halfway between those two. So I think causes are there in the world. There is a real order of causation out there in the world. But a lot of the time when we're doing science, what we're interested in is explanation. And as soon as you start talking about explanation, that prompts the question, well, who it is that needs the explanation and what is it that they need explaining? So there's always, it's always relative to some particular kind of unenlightenment in the person doing the questioning and the explanation provides a form of enlightenment. So um, causal explanation is in the middle and it's kind of selective. We pick out those parts of the causal flux of the world which are of interest to us and they're objective bits but we pick them out because they're of interest to us and we fit them into our explanations. So uh, why am I going on about that? Because I suspect that a relation to causal explanation is important to you for your ontology. I certainly think myself that what goes in explanations is buying a ticket which perhaps isn't on its own sufficient for admission to ontology, but it, it certainly gets you a kind of prima facie right to be counted on the ontology. If we need something for explanation, then it probably goes in the ontology. Probably all of human action explanation is related to social ontologies and not to primitive physical ontologies, unless you're a physicist, unless you're actually working as a physicist, most of the time, your ontology, so, so the explanations that apply to you are going to be to do with social frameworks and social ontology. And therefore, in explaining you, we're going to need those social ontologies. So I, I want to get to ontology via explanation, I think. And that's why, because I'm a sort of relativist about explanation, maybe I'm also a sort of relativist about ontology. Thank <laughs> you.